Welcome to our online service from Christchurch Hillcrest in KwaZulu-Natal. We encourage you to join us in praise and worship of our one true God, to hear his word read and taught in all truth. Let us quiet our hearts and minds from the distractions of the challenges we face every day and come to his throne in humble prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer now, knowing we do not deserve this privilege. You are the creator of the universe, and we acknowledge we are sinners, deserving only condemnation for our sins. Yet you saw fit to send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. We too can have life with him if we but believe in him. Help us to quieten our hearts and minds to hear his word read and then explained further by Joma in all truth. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church family. Let us use Psalm 119 as the basis for our prayer this morning because it is truly a psalm that leads us deep into God's word and teaches us how to love God's word as the psalmist did. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only in his paths. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. And I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Abba Father, we come before you today as your people as another year stretches before us into uncharted territory. We are your flock, Father, and how we long to serve you well this year, to know you better and love you more, to grow in our Christian lives, to do better as your children, as spouses, parents, colleagues, and in fact, in every role we have in life. O oh Lord, give us wisdom as we step into this year. And to receive that wisdom, your injunction is that we hide your word in our hearts. We may experience trouble and distress and still find solace and delight in your truth. Our feelings change, but your word never changes. Your word is truth. Your word is trustworthy. Your word is a lamp to guide our feet and a light for our unknown path. Thank you for this magnificent psalm that walks us through and encourages us to delve deep, even to saturate ourselves in your life-giving word. O oh Lord, strengthen us to do this more and more as we start every day of 2022. Thank you, Lord, that your word is placed above all else in this church, Sola Scriptura. We are blessed beyond measure to have the word unembellished, unmanipulated, fed to us. And we thank you for our Pastor Jomo who is exhorting us and encouraging us 
to read our Bibles diligently, to help us grow and to give us comfort and direction. We pray, Lord, that we would be a people of prayer this year, not superficially, but prayer that wrestles and seeks your face. We pray right now, Father, for each member of our congregation and their wider families. Please, Lord, meet us in every situation. We are flawed human beings. Please be merciful and gracious as you deal with us and teach us. Lord, we pray for our country and thank you so much for guiding us through another wave of COVID. Please, O oh God, bless our beloved nation abundantly this year, even as you've sent us such abundant rains and hot sunshine to follow. Bless our state president and his government. Give them courage to stand for right and truth, humility to call on your name, and strength and integrity to carry out your will and your will alone. We commit our country and government to you this day, Lord. We wait for your word now, Lord, as it is read to us and taught to us. Bury it in our hearts, Lord, as treasure, and let us delight and meditate on what we hear long after we leave here today. Soften our hearts, Lord, to love you with all our hearts and to love your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. The reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Signs for Moses. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave you men his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger bent against Moses, and he said, What about your brother? Aaron, the Levite. I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him 
and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church family, and welcome on our third service of 2022. And I'm sure by now you have noticed that very much the theme we are following is that of sinking our teeth in the word of God and then applying that knowledge in our Christian life. And so last week we saw Joshua challenging his generation to make a decision about who they will serve. And he said he and his family will serve the Lord. And so today we continue in that theme, but looking at Exodus 4, the passage that Brenda read this morning. So would you please just bow your heads with me and then let's pray as we engage with this passage together. Father, we pray that our Christian faith and conviction may never just be head knowledge stuff that we may live our lives in the light of your word and that we may truly be salt and light of the world, that we may be rooted in Christ, grow in him, mature in him, and bear the fruit of this Holy Spirit. And so, Father, as we reflect on this conversation you once had with Moses, may it please challenge us. And through this message, would you please rebuke us if necessary and help us to get out of our comfort zones so that we may walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you know that God in his goodness and mercy and in his wisdom, he gave us an incredible power, power to choose, power to decide what is it that we want to do and what is it that we don't want to do. And with that power, we are able to choose careers for our lives, we were able to choose schools and, and things like that. It's an incredible power that God gave to us. And that power also applies when it comes to working with God in his mission. God has given us the power to choose whether we want to work with him, to walk with him, or to work on our own and walk away from him. This choice is something we have to use on a daily basis. God calls us to partner with him on his mission. The, the question is whether we want to or we don't, and that decision lies in our hands. And so this morning, I want us to look at Moses. God shows up to Moses in chapter 3 of Exodus. He shows up in a burning bush. Moses looks at it and he's, he's amazed by what he sees. And he then approaches this burning bush. And God says to him, don't come anywhere near Moses. And the conversation begins there. And the whole point of that miracle is that God visited Moses because God had a mission for Moses. And the mission was a big one, to lead God's people out of Egypt into the promised land. You see that in verse 10 of chapter 3, God says to Moses, come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, 
the children of Israel out of Egypt. That is the whole reason why God has come down. He has seen the misery of his people. He's heard their cries and he has decided that Moses would be the tool he would use to rescue his people. And so he appears to him and he calls him. And Moses then says to God, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Oh God, who am I? To be in the presence of Pharaoh. And by the way, have you forgotten that I am in Midian because I am on the run? I'm running away from Pharaoh. How can you send me to that very powerful man and very merciless man? Who am I to go to this man? Let alone to rescue your people just to go to him. Who am I? And that's in chapter 3. And so chapter 4 continues with this conversation. Chapter 4 gives us more detail about God and Moses. So in chapter 3, while they've had this conversation, and in many ways, Moses does not only just say, Who am I? He also says to God, Who are you? And this who are you has... Two connotations. One, your people, the children of Israel, would want to know who is this God. Pharaoh would want to know who is this God. And by the way, who are you to think you can twist Pharaoh's arm and rescue the slaves who have built Egypt? So this who are you is bigger than just What's your name, God? But that's not the focus for this sermon. The focus for this sermon is Moses' reasonable reasons why he can't do what God has called him to do. All right? And that's why we're focusing on the first section of chapter 4. So in this chapter, if you look at 1 to 9, the whole of that section, Moses is arguing with God and he's saying to God the people of Israel will not believe me if I show up and tell them that you have sent me and God says to Moses they will believe you and Moses insists no no they will not it's almost like Moses is saying to God you don't know them I know these guys and God says no they will because I am sending you. And moreover, I will go with you. And Moses is like, no, God, no, no, it's not going to happen. And then God graciously gives Moses three signs. If you read that, you see he says, do this, do this, do this. And Moses does it. And then when Moses is convinced, you think, all right. Okay, Moses has got it now. And Moses is going to say, sure, God, right, let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to go to your people. I'm going to tell them that you have sent me and I'm going to go to Pharaoh. No, Moses doesn't do that. What does Moses do? Have a look at the next section, which is um, 4, 10 to 12. Moses pulls another rabbit out of his head. He says to God, okay, let's say they will believe me. But, what, but I'm not even eloquent. I am not able to speak that well. This job needs someone who can speak, someone who can address Pharaoh, someone who can address the crowd, the people of Israel. And I'm not that person. You notice it? He says to God, I am slow of speech and of tongue. I, I cannot speak. Public speaking is not my gift. I am not the right person for the job. And once again, God just graciously remind Moses that he is his creation. 
You know, God says to Moses, I created you. I created your mouth. I created your ears. I created your eyes. Everything that you see in you is a product of my hands. So you're good. I know you. I know you well. You're good for the job. So, and God says in verse 11, therefore, all right, which is now is God's conclusion about this conversation. You say you are not eloquent. I say you would have enough to be able to speak. So don't stress about it. Therefore, go and I will be with your mouth, God says, and teach you what to speak. What an assurance. God says, okay, that's your concern. Despite the fact that I created you and I believe and I know that you're perfect for the job. But to address your fears, I'll go with you. I will tell you what to say and I, I would guide you. And at this time, maybe Moses is scratching his head and he's thinking, all right, God, I see. All right. I think they would believe me. Um, I, 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 I believe you. I believe I can be able to speak well. And God says, sure you will. Sure you will. And then Moses says, no, God, no, no. No, no, I can't do that. But having ex exhausted his excuses, Moses decides to pull the biggest punch. Uh, he says to God in the, the next section, which is 13 to 17, he says, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Oh, God, please send someone else. You see that in verse 13. I mean, if you didn't have the Bible in your hands, you wouldn't believe that Moses would say that to God. But there it is. Moses says to God, I don't want to go. And God says, no, you must go. I'm calling you to this. This is your mission. He says, they won't believe me. And God says, no, I will make them believe you. He says, I'm not eloquent. And God says, I'll speak through your mouth. And he says, no. Just find someone else. Please, Lord, just find someone else. I'm not worthy of this calling. I am not the right person for the job. Pharaoh will never listen to me. You know, after all, if you remember the story, Moses and this Pharaoh, they grew up together. And Moses ran away because God's people we're questioning his credibility. And that's why he says they won't believe me. And he says, I'm not good when it comes to speaking. And yet he's arguing with God the whole time. Isn't that amazing? That he's not able to speak. And yet he speaks so eloquently about why he cannot go and do what God wants him to do. Isn't that amazing? And he says politely, but firmly, God, please just find someone else. Someone with a skill set for this job. And that's not me. Someone who's more suitable for the task. And that's not me. Someone who is better than me. Someone who has a passion for the job. And that's not me. There are many, many honorable, strong men in Israel who could do this job. You are looking at the wrong person. That's really what Moses is saying to God. In spite of everything that God has done to show him that he knows him and that he will take care of him, he would look after him, he would walk with him, he will protect, with, he will protect him and he will speak through him. And Moses says, that's not enough, find someone else. And at this point in time, probably you're sitting there and you're shaking your head in disbelief. How can Moses say that to God? How can Moses do this to God? 
And even though Moses angers the Lord with his excuses, but God graciously brings Aaron. And then God says to Moses, have a look at verse 15 and 16. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. You notice that God says to Moses, you will speak to him and he will speak to my people. But notice the link here. Moses would be God's mouth to Aaron and Aaron would be Moses' mouth to Israel. And yet when Israel listened to Aaron, it would be as though God was speaking directly to Israel. That's the kind of authority that God is giving Moses. So in other words, God is saying to Moses, you are not off the hook. This mission is yours. You must come with me and let's go and rescue my people. And here's an amazing thing about Moses' story. Is that when we read Exodus and we read the book of Deuteronomy, when they are right on the border with the promised land, we are amazed how Moses has led God's people through very, very difficult times. This man was such a faithful servant of God to his people. He told them very difficult things that they didn't want to hear. And at the same time, he encouraged them when they were down. And God kept his promise and walked with Moses from Egypt all the way to the end. And today, there are so many leadership books written about Moses and his leadership. He was a great leader. And he was a great leader because God was with him. And you know what? That is just such a good reminder that God equips those he calls. Our gracious and good God equips each and every saint that he calls to the mission. So we've had Moses's and some of these <laughs> reasons Moses gives, they're funny and you look at them and you shake your head and sometimes you even smile and thinking, Moses, come on now. Oh, my brothers and sisters, now that we've had Moses's reasonable reasons why he wouldn't Go on a mission with God. And we've also heard how God has responded to him. And of course we know um, the whole story of Moses. God has come to us. God has called us into his, this mission. To remember Jesus' words in Matthew 28. The passage that is popularly known as the Great Commission. Jesus says to his disciples, which means he says this to you and me, because we are his disciples. If we've placed our faith in him as our Lord and Savior, then this is our message. God says to us through his one and only son, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is Jesus saying to us, I have come down to rescue you. Now I am sending you 
into the nations to proclaim the gospel of salvation so that many sons and daughters would come to faith and be saved. This is our calling. And God will deliver the lost people. But he would do that through us. Now you know, as well as I do, that many people are not part and parcel of God's mission. Now I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about people who don't believe. Because those who don't believe are our mission field. But we are the missionaries. We are the ones who ought to go out and proclaim the gospel. And we are not doing a good job in that. Why? What are the reasons that people give God as to why they're not partnering with him on the mission? Well, the first one and the most popular one is that I don't have time. And some people say I don't have enough time. But it's pretty much the same thing. I am too busy at work and I have a lot of family commitments. And that's why, God, I cannot do what you want me to do. And God says to you, wherever you are this morning, God says, but I give you 24 hours every day. 24 hours. What are you doing with that time? It is a gift from me to you to serve in the kingdom. And of course to use it for other things. But the main purpose is so that you can serve in the kingdom. What are you doing with that 24 hours? See, you and I cannot argue against God on this one. Because the 24 hours we receive every day, it's a gift. There are no machines that are able to produce more time. We all have 24 hours and we cannot add a single hour in our lives. It's a gift from God. And all we can do with the time that God gives us is to use it effectively to be able to achieve more. And that means... If you say, if I say, I don't have time, it basically means, Lord, I do not have time for your work. The time you give me, the 24 hours that you give me, I use six hours to sleep. The rest of the, the time, I use it. To pursue my own goals, my own ambitions, my own desires. And I don't have time to be able to allocate it to your work. That's really what we say when we say we don't have enough time. And now think about it. Is that what you're really saying to God this morning? If you're one of those people who say we don't have time. And then other people say, I don't know what to do. Okay, I would love to serve in the kingdom. I would love to serve God, but I don't know what to do. And again, God would say to you, I will show you what to do. Come, I will show you what to do. And if you're a church member, if you're part of Christ Church Hillcrest, and I bet if you're a member of any church, you'd find that your church has so many ministry opportunities for you. So many of them. All you need to do is to come, look at it, and God will show you which ministry he wants to use you. God has a lot of work for us. The kingdom of God is spiritual expanding every day and God is in need of your hands and my hands. Do you remember Jesus said the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. And the reason workers are few is because many would-be workers have chosen 
to pursue their own desires than to partner with God on his mission. No matter who you are, no matter how old you may be, no matter where you are in your journey of life, there is a task for you in the kingdom of God. When you say you don't know what to do, just avail yourself and God will show you what to do. And then others say, oh Lord, okay, maybe you can show me what to do. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know how to do it. You see, it moves now from, I don't know what to do, to, well, thank you for showing me what to do. The problem with what you've just shown me is, I don't know how to do it. You want me to preach? I, I, I can never preach. I do not have that gift. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? That God calls you into this ministry. God calls you to teach Sunday school. God calls you to teach youth. God calls you to lead Bible study. And you say, I don't have the gift. And God says, you do. I gave you the gift. You've got it. You're not using it. Come. I'll show you what to do. I'll show you how to do it. Let's do it together. Will you? Will you come and do it? Oh God, thank you for showing me what to do. Thank you for showing me how to do it. But the fact of the matter is, they don't need me. The church doesn't need me. That organization doesn't need me. It just needs my money, but it doesn't need my skills, doesn't need me. And God says, no, the church needs you. That NGO that is helping people needs you. As a pastor, I could say this morning, we are in desperate needs of more hands on the deck. As a church family, we need more and more of you to get involved so that we can achieve greater things together as a family. We need you. We need you. We need you. Oh, well, maybe you are brave like Moses and you've given God all the reasons why you can't do what God wants you to do. And then you go to the final one, the one that Moses used. Lord, thank you, but please find someone else to do the job. Find someone else to lead the services. Find someone else to pray. Find someone else to read. Find someone else to teach Sunday school. Find someone else to teach the youth. Find someone else to help the seniors in the church. Find someone else to help elderly people with lifts to get their shopping done, to help them with doctor's um, appointments. Please just find someone else, not me. Find someone else who's not as busy as I am. Find someone else who doesn't have children who are demanding like my children. Find someone else who's holier than me. Find someone else who is more passionate about preaching the gospel, about serving in the church, not me. I am more passionate about golf. I'm more passionate about making money. I'm more passionate about being with my children. I'm more passionate about being with my grandchildren. I'm more passionate about doing my sport. I am passionate about what I like, but I am not passionate about your mission. Is that what we're saying to God? That we are grateful for everything he has given us so that we are able to enjoy it to the mix maximum and yet we are not willing, we are not prepared to serve in the mission. Is that what we're saying? When we're saying find someone who can do it better and God says, no, I can equip you. I can really equip you so that you can do the work and do it well. In fact, there are many of you listening to me this morning and you know very well, you're very gifted in a particular area of ministry, but you have chosen not to use it for whatever reason. You know 
that God has equipped you and you are not willing to use that gift at this point in time? What will it take to change your mind? What is it that God needs to do to change your mind? And when you read Exodus 4, you see how much God had to work to change Moses' mind. Here's the truth. God knows you and God has chosen you for the work. You know why? Because as Ephesians 2 says, we are his workmanship. God created you and me in Christ for good work. The work that he has prepared beforehand so that you and I may walk in his way. May serve him faithfully. May honor him with our lives. That's why God calls us. As Christians, we all have a mission. God has placed us here in the upper highway area for a purpose. And that purpose is not comfort. That purpose is not good health, good life. And prosperity. No. Our purpose is far greater than that. God has placed us here in this area to grow and nature followers of Jesus Christ. He has placed us in this area to reach our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues with the gospel. And teach those who are young in Christ so they may mature in Christ. To root them in Christ so they may grow in him. And that is our mission. We are called to serve. We are called to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is our mission. My brothers and sisters in Christ... We must know this for certain, that God wants to walk with you. He wants to walk with me on the mission. He wants to bless other people through your ministry. He wants to see many sons and daughters coming to glory, receiving salvation, coming to Christ's marvelous light through your ministry. The question is, are you available? You don't need the skill. God will equip you. Are you available? You don't have to be eloquent. God will speak through you. We need you. God is calling you. And the world is perishing. And your gift is needed more urgent now than ever before. Are you available? Let's pray together. Father, we have made ourselves available to so many things that have absolutely nothing to do with your mission. And these things have taken all our time. And so often we are mindful of the fact that we should be more involved in the mission. And yet we excuse ourselves because we have committed our lives to these things. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to take a bold step this year. To cut out a number of these things so that we may be able to serve you faithfully and to honor you with our lives lord please give us courage to make these decisions now in jesus name amen